everybody. Um, I'm Jason Young. I'm going to uh, share my screen here in a second. Um, sure, I've got the right one. Should be pretty blank. I'm going to move some stuff out of the way here. Um, all right, and uh, let's see here. Stuff for chat. Okay, um, so I have a, a folder here uh, full of goodies. Um, some FileMaker files and a few other things in here uh, that I'm going to be going through. Uh, I've got this whole thing zipped up and I'm going to put the link in chat now so folks can go through these uh, demo files um, when they get a chance. Oops, chat, sorry. I mean, fumbling around a little bit. Um, then, and one of the things in uh, this folder is I have a movie here. It's about 12 minutes long, and it's me setting up a, a Google project, um, which you're going to need to do, uh, you know, to, to uh, work with the API. I imagine a lot of you have done something similar before, but that's where you're going to get your OAuth credentials uh, and things like that. Um, so I didn't want to go through that. Uh, in this uh, presentation, um, so that movie's there for folks who haven't done that before. Uh, a couple of things to say about that. I typically like to set up a dedicated um, Gmail account or Google account for doing uh, some stuff. Um, obviously, if you're using like Google Drive or things like that, you're probably going to want to use your own account so you can access your own Google Drive. Um, that's fine as well. The, uh, this movie that I made was for this invitations demo. So I only activate the, um, the calendar API stuff. Uh, so when you do this and you wanna go through all these demos, you're gonna wanna access the, um, activate the API for Google Sheets and for Google Drive as well. Uh, other than that, it's all pretty much the same. Um, so uh, having said that, the first thing I wanna look at um, is uh, using the Google OAuth flow uh, in FileMaker or in Claris uh, so you can get the tokens that you need to make your various API calls. Um, and I decided to separate this out into its own uh, single file. And all these uh, FileMaker files are just admin, admin. Um, and I've got that here in this little kind of readme thing. Um, you do want to, um, and we'll talk about this as we go through the OAuth stuff. You know, the, we are going to be storing a refresh token, uh, as well as uh, other information about your OAuth setup. And if people get a hold of that, they are going to be able to potentially access uh, the API as that user. Um, so, where those tokens are stored and everything. You know, it's kind of a discussion you'll want to have depending on your security policy. You know, I, I feel like FileMaker security is really good as long as they're behind a file, a, you know, a good FileMaker account and a good password. Uh, I typically store them that way. Um, I've seen people say, oh, you want to encrypt them or put them in a separate API to call them. And, and, and you know, that, that stuff's all fine. Um, but, you know, depending on your comfort level, but it's something when you, if you're going to be integrating an API and, and saving tokens, it's something that the decision makers in your group can kind of talk about and get their, uh, their comfort level going. Um, okay, so this, uh, this is the kind of this Google API, Google OAuth file, and that's really all this file does. Um, when you set up your Google project, you can download a JSON file with the credentials and you'll be able to import that, and that'll fill in your client ID and your client secret. Um, you'll also need to specify a redirect U, uh, URI. You can use this one, the seed code one, if you want. Um, that's why I just got it for copying. It'll just be a splash screen, um, you know, once, uh, and I'll show you where that is. And then the various scopes that you're gonna need, uh, you're gonna wanna um, uh, show those here. And then uh, once you've got that set up, you can run this authentication routine where you're gonna authenticate into Google. And what we do is we build a 
uh, URL from um, these values and these scopes uh, and a couple of other values, and I'll show what that URL looks like. And then we're going to uh, put those in a web viewer, and then we're going to launch uh, a card window um, with the uh, with that web viewer on it, and then we're going to start an install on timer script. And what we're doing is we're looking for when that page redirects, because what happens is so now I have an install on timer going that's that's doing get layout object attribute on the source of this web viewer, um, and that will give you the full URL. So when I finish my authenticating, it's going to bring me to my redirect URL page, and it's going to put some hash parameters in there. And one of the things that's going to be in there is a code that I can use uh, with these other OAuth values to get um, some actual tokens. Um, so here, I'm going to show what that looks like. This is the account I want to log into. Uh, the web. Uh, it remembers me the last time. You may have to specify your uh, seed code. Your seed code, your uh, Google account here. Let's have a simple uh, password in here. Now, this app that I set up, and you'll see this in the movie. Uh, this is not. Um, I haven't gone through the full Google verification process. It's just in demo mode. Um, you know, a lot of folks will have uh, companies will have kind of a Google workspace already set up. You can attach the app. Uh, to that Google workspace and just make it a kind of a, a, a private app within that workspace and they won't get this screen. Uh, otherwise, they're just going to get this screen and, you know, they can say continue. You know that, you know, again, this is in development. I know it's me, so I'm not that worried about it and I know what the app uh, does and everything. So that's that. And then uh, if I haven't already specified the scopes um, that were in that original page, It'll list them here and say, okay, you, and you've probably seen pages like this before. Google wants to have access to your, your calendar, uh, your sheets and Google drive uh, and things like that. So that's what we're, uh, that's what, you know, you'll get an approval here. And then we just say continue and then at, um, it goes to that redirect page really quickly grabs that um, code and then does an insert from URL. And we'll look at these scripts in a second. Uh, call um, with that code to get a refresh token and an access token. So I'm just going to step through these scripts or take a look at these scripts here. So, you know, here's the authentication file. It's going to bring up that card window uh, with the web viewer, and then it's going to start this install on timer. And then this timer script is going to run every uh, five seconds or so. And again, it's going to look at the URL for when a code uh, is in that URL, you know, the code parameter here uh, is in that URL. So that'll happen once you've authenticated, it'll take you to that redirect page, and then you can look for that code, and then we parse it out. And then once we've parsed it out, then we're going to call another script with a post. This is some, some OAuth flows will give you the refresh token right in those hash parameters. Google just gives you that code, and then you need to do another post, and you're going to build up. This is kind of a, this is not JSON. This is the old school uh, URL encoded name value pairs where you're going to build uh, parameters here uh, with the client ID of you know, these OAuth values. And you're going to specify the redirect page. Grant type is I'm giving it a code. Um, you know I'm not going to. You can uh, re-engineer these. And then we're going to uh, build that up and then we're going to post that uh, to Google. And that's going to give us back a, a refresh token uh, and an access token, and we're going to store those. Now, the access token, uh, we just store in a global value and those only last an hour. Um, the refresh token basically won't expire and then you can run as needed this script refresh token and send your refresh token up with these other oauth values 
and that will get you a new access token. So you can kind of basically say, okay, it's been an hour. I need to get a new token. Uh, sometimes people get a new token every time, you know, if you've got a server side script running once a day, then, you know, you just get a new token then. So th that's why I've kind of had this broken out into its own script of when you need it. Um, I also have, uh, and you'll see this in the examples. If I get an authentication failure, when I'm calling the API, I'll silently call this script and then run it again. So, you know, I can either kind of keep track of when it's going to expire, or I can just let it fail and get a new one and then run the script again. And all those, you know, and I've got examples of that in my example files. We'll look at those. Um, I think those strategies all work fine, um, you know, depending on, you know, what makes the most sense to you. Um, but you know, it's going to expire in an hour. So you can grab the UTC or grab the timestamp, you know, and check before you get into it. Um, and then again, this, this, uh, these two fields here are going to be your global fields where we're going to stick the access token. Um, and, and then we're going to store the refresh token under the account name that was logged in. So, you know, when I'm logged into this page with a, uh, into this file with a FileMaker account, I'll have a specific refresh token. So if you've got 20 users hitting this file, it'll automatically create a record matching their FileMaker account with the refresh token. So, you know, they're, they're logging into the correct, <laughs> so they're logging in as themselves, <laughs> which is, you know, a, a good experience you want to provide. Um, so that's uh, kind of basically it. I wanted to show just what this um, authentication layout looks like. You can see I'm building, you know, here's kind of the base URL that Google gives you. And then we're pulling the client ID. Uh, we're going to build the scopes uh, from that list that you put in there. Those all need to be provided uh, in this initial authentication. Um, the redirect, the redirect URI. So these are all kind of validation values that Google wants to make sure you know what they have when you go to authenticate. And then um, one that's this uh, access type offline. That's an important one to point out because that's what tells it that you want to use a refresh token. Um, some people don't want to use refresh tokens. They want to have you log into Google uh, every session. Uh, depending on what you're doing. So by removing that, you'll, you know, you'll just get an access token when you do your post, um, your initial um, uh, post with the code, you won't get that refresh token. So that's what that uh, variable um, uh, uh, specifies. So I want to point that out again, when you're having that conversation about security and what your comfort level is with what these tokens are and where they live, uh, you know, that that's one of the things I, Again, I, I'm pretty comfortable with putting a refresh token with a FileMaker account that's behind FileMaker security. Uh, haven't had any issues with that, you know, in any of the APIs. And and this OAuth flow is the same, you know, for Salesforce. It's you know, there's little subtle differences between this and um, Salesforce and uh, Microsoft. Those are the ones I've worked with, but I've worked with a bunch of others. I can't think of them right now, but. Um, so, you know, getting this OAuth flow down in Google will really help you uh, working with, with working with other APIs. And that's another kind of point to why I think talking about the Google stuff is important. I think Google is one of the most approachable APIs. They've got problems with their docs. They have things that are very hard to find. Um, but I think it's the easiest one to get started with. And once you've kind of you know, you never master them, but once you've got a good sense of how the Google API works, going on to another one like Salesforce or what was it, Acquire or and, uh, Box, um, Dropbox, those all become a little easier because you, especially with the authorization stuff, you will you will have gone through that once with the Google things. The other thing, you know, Google Docs, some are really good, some are not so good, depending on the API. Um, but the amount of information on like Stack Overflow for the Google APIs is probably about as rich as you're going to find. Um, you know, so learning how to Google stuff and, and, and getting stuff that way, um, you know, that's another reason why 
if it's like, oh, I want to learn how to use an API with FileMaker just to learn it, then, you know, starting with Google, uh, that would be my recommendation as well. Um, so that's kind of uh, what I wanted to talk about for the OAuth. Um, I put these. Oh, so I, I had have a question. A couple... Yeah, give me one one second. Let me just I want, and then I'm, I'll take a little a break. I have a table occurrence called session that has the access token and expires. And then the other demo files that I have are going to refer back, you know, all the OAuth will get handled by this file and you drop that session table occurrence in the other files and that's how you get your access token. Yeah, this is a good good point for a uh, good stop for uh, questions right now. Uh, you, when you're talking about refreshing tokens or just like logging in again, what, oh, is there any comparative overhead time for any of that? Um, well, the that initial, um, so it, it, I, I don't know if I need to repeat the question like ours. So the question is, what's the overhead time for relogging in and things like that? Uh, the it's pretty much what you see in um, what I just showed. The authentication window where you have to enter your name and your password, that takes as long as it takes, you know, if you're copying and pasting it, but it's very quick. And then um, even on a slow internet, getting the, when you have the refresh token and running this script here, uh, this refresh token post, uh, it, it takes less than a second. So getting a new access token, you know, it. I don't have a problem. Like I said, just having people do that at the beginning of the script, or if it fails, quickly silently calling this script and having it run again to refresh to get a new access token. I think it's pretty negligible. Uh, you know, I think people have an expectation if they're hitting an API, it might take a second, maybe two, you know, depending on the operation. And this is about as light, um, you know, as an operation as you're going to get. So does that does that answer your question? Yeah, and there are some other questions in the chat there. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'll get better at this. All right, I can read them off if you like. Uh, Sam H, he's asking, is there any restriction of the redirect URL? It, uh, yes. Um, there are some, but not really what, not when you're in development mode. <clears throat> so you can definitely play around with this um, with a, uh, when you're in, um, in that movie, uh, when you set it up, you can uh, pretty much specify anything um, when you're in development mode. Now, if you were going to release a, uh, like a product that was going to be public outside of your Google workspace, then you would probably want to get your own domain and make sure that it all matches up. Google's changed their, their rules about that a little bit. Um, we have other folks using that redirect URI uh, that I put in there, that simple uh, seed code splash screen. Um, but you can just use your, you know, if you have a company website, just use your own website. Um, that's a lot of people do that and it'll just redirect. So there are some, but not, you don't, I don't think it's really a consideration unless you're really going to create, you know, a public, you know, like a FileMaker product that was going to be, um, you know, that you were going to be hitting uh, that wasn't within, that wasn't in development mode or wasn't private within a Google workspace. So that's, uh, those are the, restri the uh, restrictions that I'm aware of. And I think that's it. So I think we'll, uh, so, so setting this up now. Yeah, so Stephen uh, makes a good point. To, so setting this up in house with a company, you know, is very quick. You just say it's private, and you know the the the, the domains are you know all going to be pretty much registered, and then you're not going to get any kind of warning screen, you know. So if you log in as a member of that Google Workspace, and that's I would say 75, 80 percent of the time, even more, probably 90 percent of the time. When we've when we're actually dealing with clients, um, that's the, that's the scenario that Stephen's talking about. And we, you know, what I tell them to do is set up a Google project, you know, under their workspace, 
and then they can, you know, they can do their credentials and then just import them into this file here. If they wanted to change the redirect URI so it's not spamming them with the seed code logo, you know, that's that's easy to do as well. So, you know, this this Google OAuth file, I wanted to make it as um, as portable uh, as possible um, for folks who are doing that. But I think that's that's exactly right. And it, you know, and if you you know, take it, you know, you're probably going to be, if you're going to be taking a product to the marketplace, you know, with FileMaker that's using a Google API like this, um, that uses OAuth, uh, you know, you, that, that's, um, cause you don't need a redirect URI for maps or anything like that. Then you're just going to use a key. And I, I don't want to get, get too much into that, but this is stuff where you're going into a Google account, into somebody's calendar, into somebody's Google drive into into somebody's Gmail. So, um, so I think that's, uh, that's good. And, you know, again, there's a lot of, this is just kind of the curve. There's a lot of discussions about, you know, security. I'm sure there's people who'd be like, you know, that's crazy. I would never just store the refresh token like that. And there's a lot of people like no problem. So again, I, I, I've never had any problems, but I understand, you know, you may need to have those uh, conversations if you're working something like this. Yeah, about, yeah, Steven says about as much work as Zulu. So. All right, uh, so let's, so we got the, we understand the authentication process. We, you know, if some, another question occurs to you, but, you know, it's kind of a one-time deal. All these, you know, one of the great things about FileMaker is the, um, you know, insert from URL works on the server. So a lot of times, you know, um, you know, you have a daily script running on the server that does some kind of API call, updates some information or pulling some information in. Um, you know, you have to go through this, uh, a person needs to go through this authentication process one time to get that refresh token. But once you have the refresh token, pretty much everything can be done on the server, uh, web direct, um, you know, uh, XML, uh, any, any of the, uh, any of the, um, different, uh, environments that would, uh, that can call scripts, uh, insert from URL is available for all of them. And really, you know, really nice on web direct, you know, for some things like that too. So, um, okay, so let's move on. All right, so the, the next thing I wanna look at is, is this invitations demo I did at uh, Pause on Air. Um, this is a pretty uh, simple uh, little demo file here. And I like I like this one a lot um, because it it um, it has kind of the, a lot of the basic calendar functionality uh, that you would have if you wanted to crack the shell uh, with the Google uh, Calendar API. Um, but it's also a neat little uh, problems. Um, Problem, it solves a neat little problem that we run into a lot uh, with Dayback, our calendar product. Uh, and for getting information to people outside, you know, who don't have a FileMaker license or who are outside of your organization. Um, so uh, this is this uh, simple invitations demo. Um, as you can see, it's linking back to that OAuth file. So when I call that script, I'm calling the card window from the other one. I can do my authentication uh, and things like that uh, from here. And you can see kind of how, you know, some people might want to combine all this stuff into one file. You know, that is in the old days. We were always worried about how many files we had if they were working with a hosting company. I don't feel like that's so much an issue. And I really kind of like spreading the, the logic out in, in different files, kind of single purpose apps, as you may want to call them. Um, so what this, what this does is it creates an invite, it creates an event on the user's Google calendar, but then it sends invitations out to all, you can specify all of the attendees for that event and it will send the notifications out to them. Um, and they're going to get kind of that standard acceptance. You know, do you accept, do you want to RSVP email? I'll show that in a second. So I'm just going to create a. Uh, should have had one ready to go, so you have to wouldn't have to watch me painfully type. Um, and uh, 
I typed much faster in the morning. So. <laughs> so this is kind of a basic little calendar event here. Um, come back to that in a second. And then uh, here in these settings, I have this calendar settings um, uh, little card window where I can specify uh, the time zone. Whenever you create an appointment in uh, Google Calendar API, it's going to want a time zone. Uh, you don't need to do the time zone. You could do figure out the offset on the timestamps, but it's much easier uh, to do the time zone. And then the other thing that I'm, that's happening here when I launch this script is it's doing a quick post to uh, the Google API, and it's getting a list of calendars that I have right access to. So I can use my target calendar. Now, I, this is just a simple, um, you know, this kind of a, a I set up this uh, Google account um, just for these demos, so there's not much in there. Uh, but if you had a bunch of calendars in here, you know, you would pick which calendar you want to send these invitations. And I would recommend, you know, sending a, um, a single purpose, you know, have a dedicated calendar for these, you know, that you don't have to look at or anything, because that's really all it's going to do. Uh, and that's what we, you know, have, we've, we've set this up for a lot of uh, customers, both in FileMaker and in Salesforce. Um, a lot of our day back users, we do something very similar uh, to this. So I'm just going to uh, do a quick step through um, on this. Because I want to show this is our first actual API call that we're going to look at. And you'll see that I, I write a lot of these. Um, I, I kind of use the same format over and over again. Um, there's some great tools out there. Uh, Wim from Slides got a great, you know, kind of curl builder. I, you know, old and crusty and tend to do a lot of this stuff manually and, you know, like that doing that. And once I have a pattern for it, um, I think that works well. So, you know, here I'm going to make, I'm going to get my list of calendars from the Google API. So, um, you know, I've got uh, the base URL, which I'll get from the Google Docs. And then uh, there's a variable that I'm going to put on here um, or a parameter that I'm going to put on for my get basically saying, you know, you don't have to do this, but we do need to be able to write to these calendars. So I figured I'd constrain the list of calendars that Google gives me back where I have the minimum ac min access role as writer. And what that basically means is that I can write to these calendars. So that way, you know, I don't have to pick through holidays and birthdays and all that other uh, stuff that Google will give you. Um, and then this is pretty uh, standard stuff. Uh, you'll see this in every single one of my scripts. You know, the first thing we need to do is specify a curl header um, with our access token. And this one is going to fail. I can't believe it must have here. Let me fix that really quick. Used to have an access token. Actually, sorry, get to see some live um, troubleshooting. And uh, so I'm going to pull that from that global field because I think I have other scripts referencing this access token global variable. Okay, so then we can see I've got. Make sure I've got an access token. So, there's my access token. Okay, sorry about that. Happens to everybody. So, uh, so again, I want to run this, set through this thing real quick. So you can see, I kind of like to. So I'm building out my um, my curl request. So that, uh, you know the. The header, the only header I need, which is going to be the H parameter in curl. Um, and again, I think these scripts will, you can see how I do it. And, you know, if you go through these scripts, uh, you'll get a good sense of what needs to be done. Um, with Google and with a lot of the APIs, I try to send, you know, the minimum amount that curl requires uh, and let the API figure it out from there. Sometimes if you try to get too clever and specify too many headers, 
you know, you end up causing problems that, you know, didn't require them. And, and uh, curl will also fill stuff in the curl library, you know, if you don't specify some parameters. So these are the ones that, that you're always going to have, you know, you're going to do your, um, your authorization bearer, and then you're going to put your access token in there. And then I always also specify the capital D parameters parameter, which is the response headers that you get um, from your API request. A lot of time, you know, you'll get a body response um, that that's what the insert from URL will write to. But a lot of times the information that you want is going to be in the headers. And it's also really good for troubleshooting. Uh, there's really no overhead to adding it that I've ever been able to tell. If it is, it's microseconds. Um, and uh, yeah, so you, it's a good way for error capture and uh, things like that because you're going to get a, a response code like 200 or 204. Um, and for some of the responses that you send to an API, 200 is typically what you're going to get, which is success. And it means that there's going to be a body in the result. Um, but you also get 204s a fair amount, which is, means that it's successful, but they don't send you anything back. And that's a little confusing because FileMaker will actually, th the insert from URL will actually throw an error on that. And I'll show that here in a second. Um, because it thinks, you know, you didn't get any response back, but that's expected. So you want to look for that 204 in the headers to make sure uh, that your response is what you expected. So, so uh, again, these are the only uh, curl options I'm setting. So I've got my URL and then my, um, I've got my URL, I've got my curl, and then I always specify those as parameters in my insert from URL. You'll see I have this same pattern uh, going all the time. And you see how fast the actual uh, API calls are. Um, I've got those going to a, uh, a variable called response here. And one of the interesting things is that Google gives you a formatted JSON back. Um, not wild about that, but you know, it is valid JSON, so it's not the end of the world. And we can see that we've got an object back and then there's items, uh, you know, those are gonna be the individual items. So these are the calendars uh, with the calendar metadata, uh, information about the calendar. Um, and we can see uh, the summary is going to be the name of that calendar. And then when it's the primary calendar associated with that Google account, the ID is the same. If you add additional calendars and holidays and things like that, they'll have some, you know, crazy UUID uh, there. But so um, when you make requests to this calendar, you're gonna need that uh, ID. Uh, someone just asked me real quick what I don't like about the format. It's just extra space, I think. I would think it would be faster to not have the, the spaces and tabs. It's a, it's a larger response. Um, and, you know, it doesn't affect, you know, using JSON get element on whether it's formatted or not. If I need to format it, I'll format it with the JSON format elements if I need to go through it. So, I, I, I mean, it comes back and what, you know, I'm kind of picking corn at a, at a crap here, but, the, you know, it comes back in milliseconds anyway, but it would probably be just that much faster if it was compressed JSON. Um, same thing when we send JSON up. Uh, you know, we don't send formatted JSON up. Uh, you know, I think the formatting is for learning what the body looks like and the structure what it looks like. So, you know, I don't like it because I'm crusty and difficult, not that it's like a deal breaker or anything like that. So, again, this, this parse is just fine and it's kind of nice for a demo like this. I don't have to throw it in a JSON format elements. Um, so that's that. And now I can go through, uh, you know, um, some FileMaker stuff. So here I'm going to look for, oh, and then let's look at our response headers. So these are what the headers uh, come back. And then I'm all, you know, this top row is always going to be what, you know, your expected result. So basically I look for that expected result. You know, did I get the 200 okay in there? If I did, I know everything's fine. So um, this is what I use for my air capture is based on the response headers, not the body. Um, some people, you know, Google, if there's an error, it'll probably give it to you in the body as well. Um, but if you send a really malformed uh, query back, you might get HTML in the body. You might not get JSON. 
Um, whereas you always, almost always going to get response headers back. So between this and the body of your response, um, you know, you got everything you need. So response headers again. Okay. So you get the idea there. Uh, you know, then I'm just going to use um, uh, FileMaker functionality uh, to parse that JSON and just create. I've got a table just called calendars uh, that I can make that um, uh, that I can base that value list on that we see here. So that's all that's doing is just giving me a list of calendars. But getting a list of calendars, if you're going to do anything with the Google Calendar API, that's going to be the first thing you do. Uh, you know, if you need to create an event, you're going to need that calendar ID um, to be able to do stuff. So uh, that's why I think that even though it's got a pretty small purpose here, as far as our target calendar, I think it'll be good for folks to learn how to, you know, that'll be your first request. Give me a list of my calendars. Let me get the ID. So then when I start creating events to them, um, I know what to do. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. Yeah, I answered the question about what I, why I was complaining about the uh, formatted JSON. So now, um, oh, and then in my settings here, this is just a FileMaker thing. Uh, here's like the people, you know, in my org that I can send invitations to, and I'm just going to send out uh, some to myself here. So here on the second tab, I've got a little uh, selector. So let's just pick. I'll just pick all these people. And then, um, so now when I hit this button, and I'll, I'll go ahead and step through this, I'm going to create a Google Calendar event. Um, it's going to have an array of attendees based on this information. Uh, and then I'm going to post that, and those invitations are going to go out pretty quickly. Uh, typically within 30 seconds, sometimes as fast as five. I think 30 is the longest I've ever seen. Um, so. And then here's a real gotcha. Uh, Google will not send the notifications if the event is in the past. So you get no error, you know, this is something, I mean, I spent hours trying to figure out what the heck was going on. You know, no error codes back. I mean, the event was created, but the notifications didn't go out. No kind of error message of why the notifications didn't go out. Google just won't send them out if they're in the past. So as a longtime calendar developer, it's very common practice to create events, you know, from three years ago. So, you know, and you're not spamming up the data, but, you know, the current database with stuff as you're experimenting. So you can't do that here. You have to put them uh, in the uh, in the in the uh, in the future. Let's see, Steven's chiming. Yeah, I'll, I'll show, I'm going to step through this now, Stephen, you can see what they're, well, actually, I'll show you. So I created just a JSON file. So this is what I'm going to build. This is a couple months old, so the date's wrong. Uh, this is what I'm going to build for my JSON request to create the event. Um, and... So description, you know, I'm mapping my fields from here. Uh, summary is the, the title. And then this is how Google, um, you send your, your dates to Google. It's kind of strange. There's a, there is no all day Boolean or checkbox um, in Google events. You either specify date or date time. Uh, and then it infers the all day of which one you've done. And I've found, uh, Basically, I create this object first with all nulls, and then depending on whether the appointment is all day or not, I, you know, I overwrite the null uh, with the appropriate one. And then here is the, uh, the time zone uh, that I'm specifying. I did this one in Georgia, so it was America, New York. Um, uh, so, that, so here I don't have to worry about um, figuring out the offset and what time zone that way. I can just put the time in as it's specified here uh, and then specify the time zone from, from that dropdown that I put in there. 
So um, you can do you can leave this as null, uh, but then you need to make sure you put your offset in here. You know, it'll be like minus 0600 or minus 0700 or plus, um, you know, depending on where they are in the world. But I think doing the time zones is, is the easier way. And that's how we do them with Baymac and, and everything. We just specify that time zone. So uh, that is what this re request is going to look like. And then let's go ahead and send it out. We'll just kind of look. I'm not going to step through every step here, but you'll get the idea. Send invitations. Da -da 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 -da. Have overwritten my uh, demo here. Don't think that's going to hurt me. I've got something missing here. Sorry, folks, but uh, I'll uh, I'll uh, correct the the download here uh, after the meeting to get these errors out of here. I don't think that's going to be a problem. We'll see if it is. I've got the one from Pause, which I know is working. I got. Probably got a little too cute breaking out the OAuth. The one that I did at pause had the OAuth stuff uh, built into it. But uh, that's what you get for getting cute. Um, so let's go ahead and run through this and see. So my air stuff, and then I'm going to build up my uh, array of attendees. And then I'm going to build my uh, start and request. So all this is building out my JSON. And then, uh, so once I'm here, I'll have that JSON request. It'll look a lot like what I just showed you. See that? Uh, then our base URL. And here's where I need to know that Google Calendar ID. Um, that'll be that actually is going to be in the URL routing um, to know which calendar we're writing these to. So uh, that's going to pull from that settings um, uh, field that we did in our calendar settings. And then this took me a long time to figure out the documentation is not very good on this. The reason for it, um, and we'll, I'll talk about it in a second, but you have to specify that you're going to send updates in the URL parameter itself and in the JSON. So somewhere up here in the JSON, I've specified the, uh, the send uh, updates. Um, the reason is, is that when you delete, the, um, when you delete the event and want to send updates about that, uh, you're not going to have any body. So that's why I think they have it in both places. That's just a guess on my part, but you know what? I didn't have this parameter on it, but I had it in the JSON, the, the appointments, the uh, invitations weren't going out. It took me forever to figure that out. Um, and then now we're going to get, uh, you know, again, that similar pattern. I'm going to build my header for authorization. The other thing, when you're sending JSON, you're going to want to make sure that you include this header as well. These are the two most standard headers that you're going to send. Um, if you don't send this, uh, don't specify this header, it'll, uh, curl will think that it is a URL encoded. Um, that's the default, which is the old, old name value pairs with the question mark. And then uh, this equals that, this equals that. Um, and most Google APIs are smart enough to figure out what you've done uh, and, uh, you know, that's not a big problem. Um, they'll uh, say, oh, this is JSON and they'll convert it and they'll uh, process it correctly, but some don't. And on this one, like the Google Calendar post, if I didn't specify this header, just to give you an example, the kind of stuff you know, take years off your life. Um, I, I didn't have the header specified and it worked on the post, but then when I did a patch, which is an update, it um it failed um and then once i added the header back you know they both they both worked as fine so these are the you know kind of the minimum headers you're always going to want to send uh for a post to get you know there's no body so you don't really need to specify what you're sending up there um and then 
curl, if I specify uh, the D parameter, which is going to be the body of the request, which is going to be the JSON, it automatically will default to post unless I specify it with the X parameter. So in this case, I basically want to say, hey, if I have a Google event ID, which means that I've already created this, because I, once I've done this, I'm going to save the ID back um, in the event, you know, for, for updates. If I have a Google ID, then I'm going to want to do a patch. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to want to do um, the, uh, um, sorry, uh, I'm going to want to do a post, so I don't need to specify it. And then again, the capital D, and it's important to keep these straight, capital D is for dumping headers, small d is for your request body, and they are not interchangeable, and that will uh, drive you crazy as well uh, when you're learning. Um, and then you always want to quote this stuff too. You know, this curl is an old command line tool, and spaces in the command line are delimiters, unless you've got quotes wrapped around them. So if you have unquoted values here, um, curl's going to interpret that as a delimiter, and it's going to cut the value off. So the first space it hits in your JSON if it's not quoted, or the first space it hits uh, in a header, uh, it's going to cut it off. So if you know if you don't quote this, your uh, your authorization will fail. If you get this, then it's going to you know you're going to get some kind of JSON error. So important to remember to quote those. Um, and right, and then. Here, uh, just like that patch, so we're basically saying if we've got a Google event ID, we're going to tag the Google event ID on the end of the URL so it knows that we're, we're targeting a specific event. If I don't have the Google uh, event ID on here, it knows it's a post. If I do, it knows it's a patch. We still need to specify patch uh, here or we'll get an error. Um, so we'll uh, keep stepping through this stuff. And then we'll uh, do our insert from URL. Take a look at our response. And now you see we get it's created the event, and we get a lot more metadata than we sent. You know, so Google's going to fill in all of the defaults, uh, like the creator, the organizer. Um, you can see the date time, start date time. It's got an iCal UUID. Here's our attendees thing, and we can see that it's defaulted those all. Uh, uh, I think actually we sent the needs action in there, which tells that those notifications are going to go out. Um, so this is, we get based, the nice thing about Google is when we do a post or a patch, we do get the whole, typically we get the whole body back, uh, which is nice. Like uh, some APIs, uh, when you do a post to create a new record in Salesforce, you get a 200 uh, response, but the only thing it gives you back is the ID. So if if fields have been transformed by some kind of server side process or something like that, you have to query those after you've done your post. And it's nice to get a little payload back that just has the ID and that is all you need. Um, and it tells you that your creation was successful, but if I need to do something with some of those default values that were filled in, I have to make a, a, a second query. So it's kind of nice that Google uh, sends them all back to you like that. Uh, so now we've got that and I'll just, uh, there's nothing else here to, and then we'll write that Google event ID uh, back to our uh, thing. And then let's take a look here. And we can see these all got, uh, these should all be. Sometimes you got to refresh the, you can see that these all went out to my different Google email addresses. And then I sent one um, to Microsoft as well. Uh, one of the really nice things about using Google here is that almost every mail and calendar client wants to play nice with Google. So even though this was created from a Google Calendar, I get the nice, you know, I get the RSVP button and I can say, yeah, I'm going. Uh, here I'm gonna say, uh, maybe. 
here I'm going to say maybe say I'm going and here I'm going to say go. So that's a nice experience, right? So I need to get information out. I can pa I can stuff this description field with a bunch of stuff in it. Um, you know, if I've got a bunch of information I want to get out to people, but uh, I think you could send 200 invitations or two, you can have 200 attendees, um, just standard using the attendee array. Um, you know, so pretty nice for classes and things like that. Might even be two. I can't remember the number, but it's very generous. But if you reach that, then you can use like Google groups and send it to like 10,000 people, you know, if you so desired. Um, so that's a, uh, uh, you know, nice little uh, operation. And then what's cool here is that <clears throat> now what I can do is I can query this event and that of the event attendees have been updated with their status. So I can pull that information back into FileMaker and I could do this on a timer. Uh, here I just have it in a simple script like this. Don't know what that is. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be hurting us, but I'm going to just take it out. Sorry about that. Demo, demo. God, it's been a long, been a long time since I've done. When I did one at pause, there was no screen or anything, <laughs> so you know they didn't have any TV, so it was just me talking. So I didn't have to worry about my demos failing. I just said, "This is how this will work." So. Uh, so same thing. So we're now we're going to do a get um, on that event. So we're going to specify the Google Calendar ID. We're going to do the Google Events, and now you see there's no small d. So now curl knows that if I don't uh, specify the small d and there's no body, that's going to be just a get. Um, I still need to do authorize it to get that information, and then uh, always again going to get my response headers as well. And now we're going to look at our response. And we're going to look at our attendees and we see we've got tentative, accepted, accepted, tentative. So pretty neat uh, that we can get that information um, back and then update our attendee status so everybody who's using FileMaker uh, can see it. So uh, I think that's pretty neat. Um, and again, a lot of people uh, we do this a lot for custom work and day back and, uh, and various things. Um, and in sending this stuff uh, via JavaScript, uh, you know, to a, to like a to middleware to get the responses. That's how we do it from day back. Um, and then, uh, you know, or here just using curl, the logic's pretty much the same. So, uh, and then you can see here, you know, here's my Google event and I can actually Open that event, Google Calendar, because you get a link. It's probably the wrong calendar yet. Google's not great about that if I've got all these things. Uh, date was it? You'll see that it was. There it is. So there's the actual event if I ever needed to futz with it or do something with it on the Google side. But the idea here is, you know, if I've got this dedicated calendar for it, um, then I, oh, actually, I'm just using the Seedco demos one here, not this reminders one. Um, you know, I don't, I never look at it. It just does what it does. And I'm not worried about conflicts or any, anybody uh, doing anything with it. So I think that's pretty neat. Oh, I'm, you're not seeing that screen. Sorry. <laughs> I'm like waving my hands around, pointing at stuff. So here's the actual event in Google Calendar. Let's see, got the same information here. So that is basically that demo. Um, anybody have? Yeah, Eric, I think uh, I'll, um, I can send it to you, uh, but give me, I'll do it first thing in the morning. So like tomorrow afternoon, use that same link and I'll update those 
uh, demo files. I don't think it's a huge deal. I think you've seen the changes that I've made, but I would like to, um, you know, I would like to actually deliver uh, demo files without uh, glaring errors in them. So that was Eric's question is, you know, should we download these again later? So, Eric, I think if that's what I, yeah, I'll uh, send you an email letting you know when folks can download again. I might do just for caching reasons, I might update the link to, um, you know, let me know. And then my, you know, everyone's got my, you know, Jason at seedcode.com. You know, if you don't have the demo files you want, just email me and I'll make sure you get them. So you should. Um, and uh, uh, are there web hooks that we can get if someone takes actions? Um, I believe that there, uh, that's a question from Stephen. Uh, I think you mean web hooks on the Google side, right? Um, so the nice thing about doing invitations is that when it puts these events on their calendar, they're going to be read only, which is so you don't really there's um, they can't move them around uh, unless you explicitly give them those permissions. So really, the only thing they can do with it is accept it or decline it, which is going to show up here. Um, if you did give them other things there, I've, I've never messed around with it, but I believe that Google does have native web hooks that you could potentially uh, set up to uh, write the information back. Um, the other thing you could do is long pull uh, for that event. You know, so if you know one of these attendees had right access to it and they moved it to a different date and time, the way I would handle it, I think doing those webhooks would be pretty complicated, but I do think it's technically possible, is I would probably write some kind of refresh thing where I could, um, you know, do the get on that event, just like I did here. Uh, this isn't just the um, attendee status. It gives me everything about that event. Um, and if I needed to update the date and time based on what somebody did in Google, I could do it that way. So I could either do it as needed, you know, from a script within the invitation, or I could run some kind of nightly script that would basically be long polling for those changes. I think that would be easier than doing any web hooks. Um, you know, there's, you know, I think this might be a place where you'd want to try to use Claris Connect or something like that if you're sending writable uh, invitations out. That's a big challenge. Um, every time we've done it, we've taken that long polling approach. Um, and then, uh, and that, that works fine. Um, but, you know, getting a, a you know, you, that would be tricky in, you know, in FileMaker, you don't, you know, you'd have to set up some kind of endpoint for FileMaker server, uh, to receive those web hooks and then, you know, run a script. Um, yeah, Steven's saying that you could use auto for that. I'm not familiar with doing that from auto, but, um, yeah, I mean, you, you know, what you would need is a webhook on the Google side, right? So if somebody edits this at Google Calendar, that's going to send a webhook. What do you do with that webhook? You could have it go to some middleware uh, and then write, you know, to the data API, um, you know, from uh, and then run a script or, you know, the old uh, custom web publishing. And again, that seems more trouble than it's. I haven't had to do that yet. <laughs> again, the, the polling from FileMaker as needed has always worked fine. Um, these are subscribed calendars. These are not subscribed calendars. Uh, you can send um, the invitations do not like that um, Outlook calendar that I showed you in Office 365. That has nothing to do with this org. That's the nice thing about this demo is I can send it to anybody. The cat they don't need to have access to my Google account. They don't need to be part of my Google work group and every mail client does a nice job with these Google invitations on the RSVP. So I can I can send them to any email address, have them RSVP. It'll presumably go on to whatever calendar they're using because uh, Google's really good about that. And then I can get my uh, information back here um, into FileMaker. So that's that's really the, that's why I like this demo so much is that it doesn't need, you know, subscriptions and you're really you don't need any kind of connections. You just need somebody's email address 
uh, and you could get them this information and get and, and complete that round trip. So I think this is this is the simplest way I figured out how to do this uh, in FileMaker and in Salesforce and Dayback and all the different things that I that I work with. So um, and then one last thing about uh, Google is the note. It's very smart about the notifications. So if I hit this button again, it's going to. Uh, I'm spec I'm just I'm doing a patch to that same event, but Google will actually detect if I've made any changes or not. And if I have changed the, if I haven't changed anything, no notifications go out. But if I change the date, then they get notification updates saying, "Hey, this meeting has changed. Are you still good?" and they get an RSVP message, um which is really nice. If I add a new attendee and then uh, send the uh, the patch to Google. Only that attendee gets an invitation. So again, Google does a lot of the, the hard work uh, for managing those attendees and the changes, which is another reason I really love this demo. Um, so you know, it doesn't send an invitation to everybody here in this list saying, "Hey, we've added Joe Schmo uh, as an attendee." Just Joe gets an email, and then if I delete somebody off of here. Then we also send a notification and they um, they get a cancellation saying, hey, this it, even though the, the meeting wasn't canceled, that's what Google tells them uh, is that it was canceled and it you know will remove it from their calendar and everything. So again, uh, Google does a lot of the hard work and all you really have to do is build that JSON with the attendee status uh, and uh, everything kind of takes care of itself, which I think is uh, <laughs> Steven says, sounds like high school. So it sounds like, a, um, uh, again, why I like this demo. And then this one's really good because it has, the demo has an example of getting a list of calendars, of creating an event on that calendar, of updating an event on that calendar, and then deleting an event uh, from that Google Calendar. And those are all the real basic operations you want. So even if you didn't want to send attendees, and just wanted to do something else with Google Calendar. I think this is a really nice demo file to play around with um, and kind of get going on that. So um, I think I'm going to move on from this invitations demo unless anybody's got any more questions on that. Looks like we're good there. Okay. All right. So the next thing I want to look at is uh, Google Drive. Um, and Google Drive is a great, uh, you know, it's got a, has a really good API as well. Um, <clears throat> the documentation on the Google Drive API is not as good. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, the calendar one is better. But like these Google Drive APIs, they've got these different sections, you know, overview, um, pretty good. Typically, you're going to be in reference because this tells you, you know, what the JSON and, and things like that are going to look like. Um, and then some of the APIs have really good samples. Uh, this one does not. <laughs> There's a very short uh, sample. When we look at the Google Spreadsheets one, it has really good samples because, you know, like a lot of lazy developers, I would, you know, just skip the reference. I don't want to read the instructions. Just give me some sample code. Uh, that I can play around with um, and, you know, and, and play with it and break it myself. So uh, the Google Drive is is pretty good. And, you know, again, you'll be looking at the, the reference um, most, you know, really under files. And we'll look at some of these examples here in this uh, next demo file. So I'm going to take that off the screen and then we're going to look at this FM uh, to drive file. Again, this is going to be admin admin and this one points um, also points back at that OAuth file so again you can uh, see the reference here same OAuth settings and again we've got the the necessary uh, scope um, when we logged in before for Google Drive so we can uh, access it so um, Google Drive, there's a, there's a ton of stuff. I just wanted to go through some basic examples and kind of step through them. Um, again, the, my main goal here is to kind of crack the shell for folks, 
rip apart these demo files, uh, see some working examples on stuff that then you can, um, you know, uh, build your own solutions from. But feel free to to start with these. You know, the the way I built the scripts in this one is I did try to separate the 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 scripts that are getting called from buttons and actual API scripts here. So these should be should be headless. Um, and we'll just rely on parameters. So I think, you know, you'll be able to copy these scripts here into your um, solutions and then, you know, use them as needed. And you'll get, you know, these are the, the ones that are actually on buttons and then they're going to be calling, uh, you know, the various scripts here. So, um, so here, you know, here's kind of the basic uh, uh, setup for we want to list some files. Um, and then we're going to, so we're going to have this basic, uh, URL for doing our get, and then there's some, some parameters we're going to be adding on. And then some of this stuff, you know, is a little confusing to me is there. The 1 is the cor corpora uh, parameter, um, which is almost always going to be a uh, user, which means that we're looking within, um. The currently logged in users, Google drive. Uh, you can you there are some other examples for the Capora and you can look at that in the docs, but I think, you know, 95 times out of 100, you're going to be specifying this parameter. Uh, you're also going to be specifying the metadata uh, fields that you get back. Uh, so these are all URL parameters and that's what these look like. Um, so when I get the fields within the files, you know, I want the name, the size, the parents. The parents is going to be the folder IDs, which is important for sticking stuff where you want to. And then anytime you have a nested, uh, you know, like an array or an object, um, you, this is, you know, you do them with this per, uh, parentheses uh, syntax. So these are the, 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 an example of the fields uh, parameter. And again, when you look through these scripts, um, you'll see it. And then the Q parameter is for doing queries, uh, which, is actually very rich in the Google Drive. Um, so that's basically what we're, these different examples are going to be looking at. Um, but you can, you know, kind of fool around with that as you go. So um, these are all going to, we're just going to be looking at different Q parameters. So uh, the first one is this top level. And basically, we're going to look at everything in the top level of my Google Drive. Now, I don't need, know the the ID of my root folder in Google Drive yet. I will need that later for some of these demos. Uh, but for the query language, I can just specify root as a keyword. Um, so this is going to be root in parents, which means that the parent uh, of the files is root. And then um, you're going to say trashed equals false. Uh, you know, Google will doesn't like to delete stuff. It'll put it in your trash. Um, and it can be a little confusing if you don't specify trashed as false, you'll get everything that's in the trash uh, on your Google Drive. So let's take a look. So here's my very simple Google Drive. I basically just have four uh, folders at the top. Um, so I'm gonna run this query now and we can see very fast. And here's what the JSON looks like. Uh, you know, based on those fields that I specified. And then I did make a little fancy, uh, kind of fancy cute virtual list version where we're parsing that, uh, uh, that JSON into a FileMaker virtual list, uh, which is probably an example of how you want to display. These don't do anything. Um, I didn't want to get too crazy on this, but, you know, you could click on this and drill, get the folder ID for that thing and drill into it and, you know, create a whole hierarchy uh, thing here. Um, so, uh, let me just step through that 1 real quick. I don't want to step all of these too much, but I do want to show that we're kind of keeping that same pattern. Um, this 1, the, the button script is a little different. We're going to build our parameters uh, at the top level. So we're going to say the folder ID. Is the root we're going to specify our query here and then I've got a kind of a. Um, the JSON parameter is the uh, fields as well and then, uh. We're going to um, right. Oh, this is just the I'm just bundling these up as a file maker parameter. Uh, and then I'm going to pass it to this kind of API script that again, I think you'll be able to copy and paste uh, into your uh, solutions. That's actually going to do the call itself. Um, oh, yeah, let me get to that. 
whoops, too fast. So in this one, I'm doing a little uh, session check. So I'm making my making sure my resource, my access token hasn't expired. Uh, and if I am, um, we're going to go and get another one quietly. Uh, so you don't have to re-log in or anything. That all just takes place under the hood. So I wanted to show kind of different ways I'm handling that in these different examples. And you can kind of pick whichever one works uh, the best for you. And again, these ones that have the actual uh, HTTP operation on them, the idea here was to make these portable. So, you know, you'll pass in the parameters um, and then these are pretty headless. So, you know, I've got my uh, query, my fields, uh, the retry. I've also got on here that if we get a 1627, I think I mentioned this before, error, that's an authentication error from FileMaker. We're also going to try to get a new token and run this thing again. So that's what that retry um, variable is. So my base URL, uh, specify my corpora's user, um, then uh, adding those parameters. So there's no JSON body here. So we're basically going to have a URL parameter that's got a bunch of stuff on it, all URL encoded. The parents, the fields, the file, corporate user, all those, and then the query uh, parameter that you specified. And then um, I must have copied and pasted this. This one doesn't need the uh, the content header because there is actually you know there's no body. Um, so again, that's a, probably just a copy and paste thing. This is this isn't going to hurt you. And you know if you copy and paste these around like I do, uh, that's not going to be a problem. If you had the small d parameter, you know that would specify JSON. JSON, but um, since there's no uh, small d, it's just going to ignore this anyway. So that doesn't hurt you at all. Um, and then uh, we've added our uh, dump headers, which we're always going to do. I'm setting error capture on here um, if we haven't done the retry. So we're going to do one retry if our authentication fails. So that's what some of this extra stuff is in here. And then we're going to make our call. And uh, we're going to see our result. And then we have our files uh, with all their metadata. And then we're just going to return that JSON uh, back up to the top level like that. So uh, that's a super basic query. You get the idea. Uh, I've got a couple of other examples. I'm not going to go too uh, deep into these, but you get the idea. Uh, I want to get all my images. You know, that's the kind of thing I can do. And this here, I'm not specifying any parents. Like I'm not looking for any images in any specific folder. So it's just going to bring all the images up. So here's some images that I have on that Google Drive. Pretty nifty, if I, you know, if I'm just interested in that. Um, you can also do some pretty, uh, I was surprised that this is in there, but you can actually uh, query the text of the files. Um, so here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for PDFs. So I'm specifying the MIME type. Is application PDF, obviously not in the trash. And then you can use this full text parameter uh, contains FMP XML result. Uh, so that's not going to be in the name. That's actually going to be in the text of the file. Uh, and we can see that that works. And we can see I've got the old uh, CWP guide in here. And it picked up that FMP XML result. Again, I've got that virtual list going. So, you know, it'd be pretty, you know, Searching files by text, I thought was pretty, pretty neat. Um, so uh, that's what that query looks like. Um, and again, all these look exactly the same. The only parameter we're changing is this uh, queue. Um, this is to search for actual uh, Google Docs. <clears throat> and I don't think I put one in there. We're going to come back to this one because uh, there is something uh, I want to show. Um, I don't believe I have any Google Docs in there yet, but we will after the next demo, and we're going to come back and look at that um, uh, to see what those look like. But basically, if the MIME type contains, so I can do contain searches, doesn't have to be equal. So the MIME type is VND Google Docs uh, dash sheets or Google Docs, uh, Google Apps dot docs, or any uh, uh, the, the one, there's one for slides. And then there's another one too, one for jams, I think, the different types of actual Google top, uh, Google Docs. Now, Google folders also contain uh, VND uh, Google Apps. Uh, so we want to 
We don't want the MIME type to contain folder, otherwise we would get our folders back. Uh, and again, trashed equals uh, zero. And then if I just want to get folders, uh, I can do that as well. And this is the same as the top list, but if I wanted to drill into all of the folders at every level, uh, I can do that too. And that's useful um, because, you know, we want to get the folder ID when we're going to stick a file somewhere. So uh, that's why, you know, you might know what the folder is, but it's like three levels deep. I don't want to have to like drill down. I can just get all the folders and then pick it. So uh, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, so those are your basic query examples uh, that you can re-engineer and, and uh, use for your own. Uh, any, any questions on uh, any of that? The silence is making me a little nervous, but. <laughs> We're here. Okay, good. We're all, all right. in awe. All right. <laughs> all right. That's a work. I guess I'll <laughs> move forward with that. So, uh, so pretty neat. So let's look at, um, so now we got a list of files, but we want to actually get <clears throat> a file. So uh, we're going to do that with a get as well. And this is what the URL is going to look like. And then we're going to specify the file ID um into uh in the per, uh in the routing here so that'll be at the end of the URL now if i don't specify this alt equals media uh parameter then i'm going to get the metadata for that file which is useful sometimes um but i want to get the actual file so i need to specify alt equals media and that's going to download the binary file and i can stick it in a container field and then the other thing you're going to want to do is specify the curl option O uh, to format the file. When you get, and a lot of APIs work like this. So this O parameter output, um, you could use either one of these, uh, <clears throat> is, a, is a useful one when you're dealing with files. Because a lot of times you'll just get the raw binary. Now there's a couple of, you can deal with that in FileMaker. You can like encode it with base 64 and then decode it with base64 and put a file name and a suffix on there um, that will, um, you know, will define the file type. Uh, but this way, if you specify the O parameter, it, curl will do it and will basically append the MIME type uh, that you're specifying. So here, uh, I'm just going to use our images example before. So he's, here are all my images. And then let's, uh, let's step through this uh, script. We're gonna actually download this file. So I'm gonna get the, the file ID uh, from my uh, virtual list. And then I've got this, um, uh, this API uh, standard file. Now these, you can't put these uh, file downloads, this binary into a variable. And I was bugging Clay about this because some of the docs say you should be able to do that, but you really, you do have to stick these in a container. Um, and I think it would be nice if they could go into uh, variable uh, because the container has to be on the layout too. So if you could stick them in a variable, uh, then you could you know stick them where you wanted to uh, without having to manage you know an actual uh, not having to bring schema into the into the into the equation. But here you need a um, a, a global variable. You get a validation error if you try to put it uh, into a variable. Clay gave me that very taciturn nod of his head like he does when uh, I talk to him about this. So, um, again, we're going to check our uh, expiration date. Uh, we're going to get our parameters that we passed in. Uh, basically, we're, um, we want the, the file ID. We want the name and the type because we are going to use that for our O parameter uh, down here. Uh, and, then, uh, this, and then here's that uh, variable. So now we've specified this O type. And again, we're our standard headers. We're always going to include that H. Here, are the content type um, that we're pulling down. Uh, probably not. I don't know if I have this here or not? I think I do. Typically, this is for the what you're sending up. So this might have been a, a failed experiment, but this isn't hurting anything. I'll have to play around with the you know pulling that. Um, but typically, when you're specifying content type, this is to find what you're sending up. Uh, and so, you know, um, this is a, J, a JPEG, 
Um, and I'm not sending a JPEG, um, but again, this, this doesn't seem to hurt anything. So, uh, and then my additional, uh, my dump headers, my O parameter, which is very useful, like I said, and then I'm going to just, there's nothing really here to see. There's not going to be any response. It's just going to stick the thing uh, right into the container field. So that's, you know, you can download the image or, you know, if it's a PDF, you would just get your PDF icon. So I love this picture. That's my grandfather and that's me right there rolling on a beach. So that must be 1970. One, I'm guessing. I think that I mean, this looks like something out of a Fellini film. I think you had the black and white with the dark suit on the beach. So um, I think that's pretty neat. And then, uh, you know, just can kind of go here. Send these images down. So I use this for my icon a lot as I'm getting older. It's my dad. So, uh, yeah, so uh, you can. Review your, uh, you know, get images out and review them in FileMaker, stick them in FileMaker containers, uh, which is a, a nice thing. So, uh, that's how that works. Um, and again, I think, uh, I just did images, but if these were PDFs or whatever, it would work the same, you know, you would just get your, if it, you can make it an interactive container and. You, you know, your mileage may vary with the interactive containers, but, uh, you know, if you stick a PDF in there, you'd be good to go. Um. I'm going to skip over this export now until I get uh, some spreadsheets. So we'll come back into that in a second. Um, oh, actually, that's right. I have, I put it in here. So now we're going to do, we're going to upload a file uh, to Google Drive. And this is a little, these are a little tricky because what we need to do is we're going to build a multi part form. Um, and I remember the first time I tried to do this years ago. You know, I was looking at the JSON examples of what this looks like and was trying to build the JSON out. Um, and I, I got it to work, but it was just like, man, that's a lot of work. But this curl parameter, this F is what you want to use. It will build the forms, you know, each form for you. So what you're going to do is you're going to create one form that's your metadata. And, you know, I've worked out the key value pairs here. Um, these are variables you're going to stick in as you uh, create this curl parameter. So you're going to name the file. Here you're going to specify a folder ID that you want to want to stick it in, um, and then this is going to the metadata is going to be JSON. So you need to specify uh, the JSON here um, for the uh, because for this form is JSON, and then. The second form you're creating is going to be the binary. You're saying the file, and then you're going to use our curl stuff with the at symbol and the variable uh, that we've set the file to. And then we need to, the MIME type of that file, like a PDF or, or whatever. Um, uh, so that's really all you need to do to upload a, a file. Um, uh, to a specific worksheet. So here or, or a specific place. So here I'm going to, I'm going to grab, actually, I'm just going to grab the zip uh, folder. And then uh, once I've uh, put the zip in here, this is the same as that uh, my folders example that was here. So this is why it's useful. Uh, I have all the folders. These are all at the top level. But if I had some nested folders, they would show up too. So I can really quickly figure out, hey, where do I want this folder to go? You know, where do I want to stick this? And then when I hit this button, we're going to upload this container uh, to that folder. So let's just, we'll step through that again. Again, this is a pretty simple uh, uh, script. The only, uh, we're getting the uh, folder ID, which we pulled from our variable list. And then we're passing that. Uh, into this, um, whoops, uh, this kind of utility upload file post. So again, once you specify the folder in here, now here uh, we're going to reference the container. Um, you can't, you could, I think you can pass a binary single value binary file in as a parameter, but here I want, I want the full, you know, uh, I'm going to do it as JSON. And once you embed that binary into JSON, it breaks. So you really are going to, you know, you're going to just use the container 
uh, itself in this script. Um, so, you know, creating global containers that kind of work throughout these and I, I put them in their own uh, table uh, as global fields. So they're easy to drop around if you needed to stick these in other uh, files. Uh, other, you know, you can't really embed that. I guess you could, you could probably encode it as base 64, put that in the JSON and then decode it into the file parameter. Uh, if you were, you know, really didn't want to have to deal with these um, global containers, but um, you know, if you're ambitious enough to do that, you'll, uh, that'll be a good project for you. And I'm glad I left it for you. So, um, so we're going to, uh, step through our session check. Here is our, um, our base URL. So we're going to, uh, we're going to need to specify upload in the routing and then it's a multi-part form. Um, again, that's all standard. Get our parameter. Our folder ID that retries part of that authentication loop that I have in. Um, and then we're going to build our request. So that's our metadata request. And now we do need, you know, for uh, uploading files when we use FileMaker curl, we do need to set them to variables. So here it's, you know, you can set a binary to a file and that's what's going to get referenced um, here in this uh, second form uh, creation. So uh, kind of just keep going through here. Here's our MIME type. I have a custom function I pulled off Dunning's uh, site for assigning the MIME types based on a container. It works pretty well. I had to add some in there and tweak some, um, but you do, you know, um, you do want those MIME types, you do need those. So that custom function works well for that. Wouldn't be that hard for somebody to write, you know, one that they needed uh, that covered the files that they were working. Um, we'll get, we'll look at this in a minute. Um, you can actually convert certain types of files, uh, to Google docs on the fly as part of this operation. So we'll look at that in a sec. There's a checkbox, uh, that's not available now because this is a, a supported mime type for that. And then, um, again, our standard curl stuff. I don't really need post here, uh, but, uh, but if for some reason. Um, doesn't hurt anything again, typically when you have a form, uh, and you don't, when you, when there's uh, a body and you don't specify it with curl, it assumes post. And then here, we're not specifying D, uh, we're specifying F, which is, which will be the body. And we're building out our form, um, uh, parameter here, uh, into our curl as well as part of the F parameter, as opposed to the little D. So if we look at curl, uh, and these I, it's nice that you could you, you can do these as return separated lists. Uh, some of the examples I just do them space delimited, but they're definitely more readable when you do them return separated. And FileMaker curl and curl in general doesn't have a problem with the with the return list. So this is kind of nice. You know, here's my authorization. Here's my response header. Here's my type, and then here's my two F parameters, you know, for my multi-part form. So that's pretty cool. And now we're going to go ahead and upload that. This one, I got pretty fast internet. Now there is a resumable upload option in Google Drive. Uh, I got it to work for my file for my Gmail example, um, but I couldn't. I haven't figured out how to get it to work uh, in FileMaker yet. There's, you have to specify the range, uh, and it seems like the bytes that FileMaker thinks that the the size of the file is different than what Google uh, thinks it is. Is I'm going to play around with that, and if I ever get it working, I'll uh, I'll probably blog about that because whenever I feel smart and solved a problem like that, um, that's a uh, you know, uh, a good one to look at. So here, uh, uh, uploaded our file. We get an upload success messages here. I'm going to look in that folder and we see that we got that zip up there. So, uh, really nice for uploading files to Google drive, obviously pulling them right from containers. Um, and then I just want to show this example as well. Uh, if I have a CSV or an, uh, an Excel sheet. 
see that it's going to detect the type and it's going to give me this option to convert this uh, to a Google Sheet. And I'm going to go ahead and put that in the Google Sheets um, folder. So if you want to get a create a Google Sheet, uh, that's a good way to do it. Spreadsheets, and we'll see. Here's that contacts one. I'm going to go ahead and delete this one because I'm going to be doing that. If we've uh, um, uh, if we want to look at the the uh, Google spreadsheet stuff as well. So those are your basic drive operations, right? Querying to get metadata about files, downloading those files. Um, oh wait, shoot. Show one more thing. Sorry, I'm going to do that again. Convert it, send it to spreadsheets. It's quick. And now we can do the same kind of, uh, we can do the reverse of that operation uh, as well. Um, so if I want to convert a, a Google Sheet to an Excel sheet, I can do that. Um, I can't down, I mean, I, you can't download a Google Doc, so this will fail if you point it to a Google Doc. You, you can get the metadata, but you can't, there's no file there to get. But you can do an export. Now, there is a 10 megabyte limit to that, so depending on uh, how crazy big it is, um, that may be a limitation. But uh, we can see now that we do have, um, it found a, a Google spreadsheet called Contacts, and I'm going to go ahead and step through that real quick. Now we're going to run this export script, give us the ID, and then we're going to export as an office uh, doc. And um, uh, basically, this is very similar to the download operation type and all this stuff. And then uh, basically, we have a switch in here saying, if the MIME type of the file we're downloading is a Google Apps spreadsheet, then we're going to use this um, uh, open format XML converter uh, to get it to uh, uh, an XLS or to an Excel sheet. So I can specify the X. I can do that uh, also with Google Docs and turn them into Word Docs. So I can create them as DocX. Oh, right. No, the, the, I can do an RTF and uh, Word Doc, but it has the suffix already, so you don't need to add it. Can't remember what that's all about. And then this is uh, for creating, uh, turning a Google Doc into a word processing doc uh, and appending DocX on it. So I guess that sometimes they can have DocX on them. That's why I'm not converting. This script works. I can't remember why that branch is in there. But the idea is so we're going to uh, step through here and we're going to specify the type as this, uh, this open format one with our Excel. And now we're going to call our um, our export uh, URL, which is here. You can see we've specified export uh, export on the um, on the routing, and oh, whoops. Some kind of clearing. I got some kind of. Uh, I'm clearing my globals where I shouldn't be. So let me. Uh, I'll 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 uh, stop the script before so that and I'll fix that as well. Sorry for these bugs. So uh, it converted the Google uh, spreadsheet into an Excel um, spreadsheet. Now I can uh, take a look at that. So uh, you know, good, nice, uh, nice feature there for getting stuff back and forth. Um, 
between Google uh, spreadsheets and stuff. So that is it for the drive demo. I know we're, you know, this is a long session. Eric said that we could probably go long if people want to stick around. Uh, I've got a few more demos on Google uh, Sheets. Um, if anybody has any questions on what we've looked at so far, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to do, I can run through the Google Sheets stuff if people uh, still want to stick around. See what kind of oh, this is the one I'm waiting for. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, and this is I. So the Google uh, spreadsheets. Uh, you could spend the the API for the Google spreadsheets is extremely comprehensive. Um, which is, I mean, you can do a ton with Google Sheets, and I doubt I. I've only kind of I, I've done a lot with Google Sheets, but I still feel like I've scratched the surface as far as all of these um, uh, demos go. The docs here are actually very good, uh, and if you want to, you know, um, how I started was this has actually really good uh, samples. These recipes here, basic reading, basic writing, basic formatting, uh, even charts, conditional formatting. I haven't gone uh, again, just kind of scratch the surface and that's all I'm going to do here uh, in this demo today. Um, run through some of these scripts and uh, and show um, again, give you some example scripts to get started. It'll have most of the basic operations uh, that you'll want to use. Um, but I was extremely impressed with these uh, recipes here um, with really good, you know, gives you the, you know, here's the, the sample code that you're sending and here's the result uh, that you're getting, um, you know, really, uh, uh, really nice. Again, this is what a lot of us want, you know, get me to the dump, get me to working code that I can start uh, playing around with. Um, I still had some head scratching and things to figure out when I got here, uh, but mostly um, uh, had good luck with this. So I'm going to go back to my uh, spreadsheets and I'm going to remove this because I think uh, the one, the one I'm doing is going to be a little bit different. So uh, see my OCD in action there. Um, so the operations we're going to run through here, uh, I basically got um, uh, five or uh, five scripts that we're going to do. Um, if you were, you know, I think in reality, you'd probably string all these together, uh, but for demonstration purposes, and, you know, again, a lot of different operations, I thought it was good to break them out into kind of smaller chunks. Uh, they're still pretty comprehensive. And, and again, we'll kind of quickly uh, step through these and see how they work. Uh, and then we'll kind of wrap stuff up. So, um, the idea here is I'm going to create a spreadsheet uh, based on the layout that I'm on. Um, and uh, did a similar thing here where I've got kind of API scripts that are headless. And then, uh, you know, here's the actual scripts that we're going to walk through, which are going to create our parameters and then call one of these. So, you know, if you want to do the uh, spreadsheet stuff, you can, you know, copy and paste this API calls again. They, they, don't have any schema attached to them. The last ones I do, the only schema that's attached is that um, those uh, containers, those global containers, but you know, that's pretty easy to sort out. So, uh, so let's get started here. I'm gonna close these up too. And I'm just gonna run these uh, right down the run. So uh, this first one, uh, and I've got some basic comments here was we're going to create a basic spreadsheet based on this layout. Now, spreadsheets, un unlike Google Drive folders, I could upload those to a specific folder. Uh, you can't do that with spreadsheets. And it took me a while to figure that out. I found that ultimately on Stack Overflow that you actually can't do that. So they'll always go to the root and then you can use a, move, a Google Drive move operation uh, to move that folder. So all of these are going to go into Google Drive. So that's why I think the Google Drive demo and the Google Sheets demo uh, kind of goes hand in hand. So um, 
here we're going to uh, uh, we're going to get our layout name and we're going to get the fields that are on this layout. So, you know, a lot of for probably in the real world, you, these will not be um, abstracted values. You know, you'll probably hard code what fields you want to send, uh, things like that. Uh, but just to kind of keep it uh, quick and easy. And again, you can see my the sample table that I'm using here is super simple. Just uh, four columns, uh, 187 uh, rows. So, um, and then uh, just a little housekeeping here. I'm going to, uh, oh, right. So, um, even though the, um, the spreadsheet uh, can't be created in a specific folder, I'm gonna go ahead and ask for that folder now. Um, <clears throat> Because when this operation is done, we're going to move it with a Google Drive operation. So, uh, so actually, let me just run through this once, and then we'll. So we're going to say spreadsheet. Choose a folder. So, um, when the file opens, uh, we do a uh, that same uh, folder query that we did in the Google Drive demo. So these are the possible folders on my Google Drive. So I'm going to. Uh, target spreadsheets, and then I'm going to go ahead and run it. And then what this script is going to do is it's going to uh, create the spreadsheet on the root, and then it's going to move them to the uh, move it to the spreadsheet folder. So at this point, I've created a spreadsheet called contact list, and then I've created the number of columns and one row, you can't do it with no rows, which is fine. Um, so we're gonna, uh, I specified the columns. If you don't specify the columns and the rows, it gives you the standard, you know, 26 columns and uh, I think a thousand rows. But just to show that, you know, in that, in those parameters, you can specify the number of columns you want. And I'm gonna look just at, at these scripts a little bit. So, you know, nothing, uh, this is all uh, building our parameters <clears throat> using the layout name and uh, the number of fields. And uh, one of the things we're gonna do is we're gonna create a range and you'll see ranges here. Oh no, that's where we get to the, the, the header row. Um, range is something you're gonna be doing a lot with a spreadsheet where you're gonna specify a starting cell uh, and an ending cell. So. Again, I want to kind of, uh, I want to fly here. I don't want this to go on forever. Um, but uh, this part of the script uh, creates the spreadsheet um, and it's going to use this uh, new spreadsheet post script. And then we're going to um, uh, move the spreadsheet uh, to a different folder. So this script is calling both of these API uh, folders. And these are pretty simple pulling the parameters again, base URL, curl headers. Uh, some of these are, you know, patches. Some of these are postings. Whenever I'm doing API calls, I uh, typically uh, like to put that in the script name. I uh, think it looks cool and uh, also just easy to uh, to reference. So, um, so now I've created my uh, spreadsheet and I've put it in the folder. Now I want to write headers. So, this one I'm going to step through. So, again, we're going to look at the fields based on the layout name. And, and I'm going to loop through those, kind of create group. And then we're going to get our uh, sheet name. Um, we've stored the metadata for that spreadsheet we've created in a global field here. And th this is just saying that we're going to write to the first sheet. Um, so we need the sheet name uh, when we're defining a range. And then this is how I do the range. Um, I've got a, a header count, which is gonna be, uh, I've created an array and let's look at that. Let's look at our headers. So I need an array. Whenever we're writing data to Google Sheets, we're writing arrays. So these are gonna be the columns. And then we're gonna create a range value, uh, which is going to be um, like a uh, spreadsheet stuff. So it'll be a 1 will be the 1st row. And then I just, I create that. I put this in a custom function. 
but I copy and paste these, so it's, uh, I don't really care. This is to figure out what the what letter is going to be the last column. So basically, what this is doing is creating a range of A1 to A uh, to D1, and that's what this range is going to look like. And then we also specify the sheet name. So this range value that you see here uh, gets used a lot. It gets used in the JSON and as in the, in the routing. Uh, when we make these uh, calls to Google accounts. So this makes sense. It's the spreadsheet name and then, uh, then an exclamation point and then their range. So nothing too magic there. So that's what we're putting together here. Um, and then uh, the values uh, are going to be the actual header. So now I'm going to pass in my range uh, and my values and my values again are just these headers. Now values and we'll see a better example of this uh, in, a, in a second for, um, we'll spend a little time on this and we'll zip through the rest of them. When we're sending values to Google Sheets, it's going to be arrays of arrays. So you have an outer array and then each array within it represents a row. So even though I'm only writing one row, I need to put that in uh, an array. So when we specify values to a range, it's gonna be arrays of arrays. <laughs> and um, so then we've got, now we've got our range defined, we have our uh, values defined, and now we're gonna use this write rows to range uh, utility script to actually write them in to Google Sheets. And as you know, Google is pretty cool about this kind of thing with live docs and updates. So I wanna just go ahead and have that spreadsheet up in the pack in the back. And again, our curl headers, you've seen all this. Now this is a put. Um, and puts, now a post is always create, patch is always an update, put is update or create. So I've got this range. If this range didn't exist, like the, the range that I've specified, like A1 to D1 didn't exist, it would create it. If it's there, it's going to override it. So that's the difference between a put and a post, if anybody was one. And now we're going to do our insert from URL, and we can see uh, that we went ahead and wrote our header rows uh, into the spreadsheet there. Headers read. So uh, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, and now we're going to do, and uh, we're going to write data uh, to the spreadsheet. Now you can use that write rows. If I know what range I'm writing to, I can use that same script to write rows, but there's also a append function where I'm just going to send an, an, an array, a row, an array of arrays of data, and I'm just going to specify the first row. So it'll be A1 to D1, and this function knows to just append that data to the rest of the spreadsheet. So let's uh, step through that real quick. There's not much, this, you kind of get the idea. Here we're going to loop through and build that value of arrays. Uh, we're going to use the same functionality uh, to get um, our uh, range defined. So I meant to put a break. Oh, I know what it is. There's a script in here. There's a there's a uh, a flag field in here that says whether the the records have been pushed up or not. So you can if if you weren't worried about deletions and updating, and you were just adding stuff uh, to the spreadsheets, you could run the append, and it would just build an array of arrays of stuff that hasn't been built yet. And I've got this in production in a couple of places where people they've just they're right putting pushing all their transactions up into Google Sheets for reportings and stuff. So it's always just a pen. So I'm gonna write through a pen. And now right here, and you can see, this is what those arrays of arrays look like. So here's all the data that we're gonna send up in our range. And, and since we're doing an append, we only need to, uh, uh, specify the first row, 
then I'm going to get the I've I've saved the spreadsheet ID uh, in a FileMaker file, so I need to grab that, add that to the parameter, so I know what my spreadsheet target is, and now I'm going to append the rows. So I need the spreadsheet ID, I need the values, and I need the range. And then notice that the range again specifies which sheet I'm dealing with. So I know that you know if I had multiple sheets on this spreadsheet, the rate the, I would know I would be writing them to the right value. And then we're gonna you know here's our base URL, uh, spreadsheet ID, and now we're specifying values. And then we're also going to append the range uh, route onto this URL. This append uh, it's kind of a parameter. I don't know when you do the colons like that what you call that. It's not really a route. It's just, and it's not really a parameter because it doesn't have the question mark. And then, then the value inputs option is all is always just stick with user entered. There are other things, but that's basically just going to be like if somebody plug, you know, type those values in manually. Then we're going to build our request, standard curl stuff, and then we're going to push that data up. And you can see there it goes very fast. Now we've added that to our, got our rows updated. So pretty neat there. Um, now I wanna do a real quick uh, script that is going to format the header. Uh, I wanna make it bold and, um, and center aligned. And there's all sorts of other styling you can add. So here's a basic example of how to format stuff. Uh, so, you know, again, I'm trying to cover all the basic operations here. Now, this one is uh, pretty interesting in the, in the Google, the, the Google Sheets API, like I said, is extremely comprehensive. So you have your standard kind of JSON calls that you're pushing up where you're, you know, pat patching and posting and things like this. But you can also run these batch operations. And I think the equivalent of these is like a server side script where I'm going to call, and this is the script I'm going to use, a repeat cell request with a with a somewhat comprehensive looking JSON uh, to it. And then it's going to to format the cells accordingly. And I got that again from those recipes examples. And you can see there's a ton of these. So, you know, I don't have time to go, you know, if if I need these, I'll find them in the, you know, from Stack Overflow. Um, but this was the example. But, you know, the idea that this API has got the equivalent of like server side scripts running is pretty neat. So um, we're going to build out uh, this parameter here. And you can see that this. Uh, this is what it actually looks like. And we can do multiple requests for that. We're going to send this to the batch update URL. And then we have multiple requests. The request is a repeat cell. And then for the, each cell that's specified in the range to this sheet ID, we're going to apply this formatting. So again, that's you know somewhat somewhat complicated, but uh pretty cool. And then uh so we're gonna then I have a script for performing the batch operation. Just go ahead and let that through. And you can see that it applied that formatting to our header row. Um, so again, you can, you know, do the and the ranges are, you know, it, it kind of infer rows, but you can do columns as well. So if I specified a range of C2 to C100, I would apply the formatting to those cells. So, uh, you know, you get the hang of it and it's, they re they used to let you query uh, Google Sheets in the old APIs, they took that away. It's like, we don't want people using this as a database, even though everybody does, it's for spreadsheets. If you wanna use a database, you know, use one of the other Google Cloud products where they'll charge you more money for. It. So that is the, the basic operation. So that's it for creating our uh, spreadsheet. Um, so now I could either append additional rows, um, and since I can't query, uh, like if I make a change to one of these in FileMaker, 
see how they look. If I make a change to one of these, I do, I am sending them as unsorted. So I should be able to infer the range um, and use the uh, the right right to rows range uh, to op to update those values. So I could, you know, look for a modification timestamp on this, know that it's been modified, and then if I had a daily script running, I could update that row in um, uh, on the Google Sheets. Uh, that would be one way to do it if this data was changing. Now, if it's all transactional data, and you or you would just append or whatever. The other option is is you can bring everything down um, and you know compare. So the other option we have is we can get our spreadsheet data. Um, now this is also a two part request. The first thing I need to do is get the metadata to tell me how many rows and columns there are, and then once I've done that, I can do a secondary. So this is going to be the spreadsheet metadata, and then I've also got a spreadsheet um, range data. So this script here, this get spreadsheet data, I'm going to call this script to get the, the, the grid properties, as Google calls them, and then I'm going to query to get that array of arrays. And then I could run a comparison between my FileMaker database and my Google Sheets. And maybe people are updating Google Sheets and I want to update FileMaker uh, based on that information. You know, so. Um, this is kind of, this is the last demo and then we'll call it a day. Uh, so I'm going to run through just this get spreadsheet data. And you can see that this is what it gets. And I'm just writing this to a global uh, text field. So you could then long pull for that. See if there's changes, update FileMaker, look for changes, update Google Sheets, you know, depending on which is the source of truth. Um, you know, I just think of Nick or, you know, sync is not a product, right? So I don't, you don't want to build too much of that logic in. Um, you want to, uh, you want to provide the tools so people can do what they really need as far as that goes. So, uh, that's basically it. Um, I'm going to fix a few bugs in these demo files and, uh, rezip the file. Again, I don't think they're real deal breakers that folks won't be able to figure out. I will let, uh, Steve know. Or, uh, Eric know when I've done that and he can post out a new link uh, for those. Uh, let me see if there's any questions, I probably tired everybody out. I'm pretty tired, um, but I'm happy to, you know, let you know what I know or, or don't know. Thank you. That was super comprehensive. Really appreciate that. Thanks. It was, it was a lot of fun to put together. You know, these demo files are, are always really fun. And John's gonna just John. So John Sindler will be like, "Where's my blog post uh, for getting this stuff out?" You know, so we can get the content <laughs> for there too. So it's good for all of us. Well, I'm 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 amazed. It's there's so much there. It's incredible. Yeah, and then it was pretty timely totally for me. Yeah, and then you know I know I haven't you know Vince you were asking me about Claris Connect. I'll be honest. I haven't messed with Claris Connect. I haven't needed to because everything I've needed to do with APIs, you know, I FileMaker has all the tools. It's a lot of fun to build. You know, that I've been doing it a while. You know, when you get good yeah. JSON back, it it still kind of feels like magic. Um, you know, in those black box apps, you know, I know it's 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 powerful stuff. I'm psyched that they're working on it uh, mm -hmm. and everything, but. You can, you know, with server side scripts on a schedule and, and script triggers and everything, you can, you can do a lot right from data FileMaker as far as working with these APIs. Yeah. Very cool. I imagine most of the stuff I showed today, I don't know about the spreadsheets. I know there's a drive connector that looked pretty comprehensive and the calendar mm -hmm. connector looked pretty comprehensive uh, as well. But, uh, It's about, uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks so much. Um, sticker, we're pretty much at the so solid two hours. I'm pretty impressed. I might a little, leave a little more time for questions, but I also uh, think I tired everybody out, so. Wow. Well, I did, I did have a question about, well, what would happen if your, your API is updating that spreadsheet on the same rows that maybe somebody's typing in? Because, you know, you can, yeah, you know, I did. People can do that. I'll test that, and you know, I'm curious about that too. Uh, when 
Google's pretty amazing about that. Like, so when we do, when Seedco does their weekly meeting, we have a shared Google Doc uh, up in the browser. And that's how we start is we all kind of type in there. And you can have two people battling it out on the same row. I My suspicion is, and I'll confirm this, uh, uh, Eric, is that, is that was Eric who asked that, right? Is that... Uh, yeah. That it's that it's going to be first in for you know first in first out. It, it, if um, like as you saw, those calls were pretty real time. Uh, the sheet updates in front of your eyes. Uh, yeah, I mean obviously that's a concern. You know, depending on what you're using the sheet for, and you know having again using it as a database and a source of truth. There's these these demos were more kind of for fun than you know and giving you the tools to put into production. You know, uh, again, the one that I'm basing this more on was one we were the only thing we're doing is appending line items to the uh, you know process line items to a spreadsheet every day, and then the guys he's got Google Studios hooked up to it, doing some pretty fancy reporting based on uh, sheets, and then sending them out to other folks as well. But my I bet that if I, I bet if I was typing in it, like even between keystrokes, the API would overwrite it, and then I would type and. You know, you'd have some kind of conflict. There's no record locking. Um, again, that Google's very. If you read up about Google Sheets, because they used to be able to query, so it's like give me a give me a cell based on a value, and they won't do that in a row and a column, and they don't do that anymore because again, they don't didn't want people using it as a database. Mm -hmm. so, so, so. Uh, wow. Um, any last questions for Jason before we call it a night? Well, it sounds like he covered it all. Yeah. I think it's, I'm, I'm pretty when happy you, I got through it. So. <laughs> yeah, I think the original plan was just what the calendar. <laughs> well, you talked me, you, Eric talked me into spreadsheets, and then I, you know, and I was, and I done some. I wanted to show it, and you just said, "Hey, if we could do, we, we could do two hours if you want." So, <laughs> yeah, you can't do spreadsheets without doing drive. So, cover. Yeah. That was a good deal. <laughs> I do have Gmail examples as well. Um, uh, oh, I missed that. <laughs> that are pretty pretty comprehensive. So, if you just type, if you Google seed code, uh, Gmail, uh, I have three blog posts with demo files. Um, for working with the uh, Gmail API, and it's you know it's doing attachments and rich text and and all that kind of stuff, and, and that's a good one too. Cool, yeah, I want to see that. Thanks. People are looking for it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, that's a, yeah. There's three demo, three blog posts. You can start with the last one. It's basically covers. Doing rich text uh, attachments and then managing threads, uh, which is really nice. Uh, you know, so you, you know, can keep track of, all, you know, responses to like you could send an initial email from FileMaker, and rather than pulling all the responses in, you can just get uh, emails back that are responding to a specific thread. So again, kind of rich text management, attachment management, and thread. Uh, management and we've we've got a lot of cool stuff with that too. And what when did you do those blogs? Oh, I see. There's <laughs> good question. <laughs> it's been a couple of years. It says oh, okay. 2018. Yeah, 2018. God, five years. Okay. It's crazy. Like yesterday, really. All right, good. So I found the right ones. It looks like. And then I've done a bunch. I've done a bunch of. I'm going to put together some Salesforce stuff too. I talked about that at a pause a few years ago. I've got a pretty nice demo file on that. Getting FileMaker and Salesforce. That'll probably be the next thing I want to check out if you ever you know want to see my face again. And like like I said, I want to get a blog post up on that. <clears throat> All right. We'll need to for that, that community. Yeah. 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 <laughs> my, my pleasure.
And uh, it's good to, you know, I, I don't do as much FileMaker as I used to, so it, it's always fun getting back in and getting to do the, the FileMaker demos and stuff. I just, I love it. So what else are you doing these days then? I do a lot of web, a lot of web stuff, uh, um, just kind of web, standard web development out of it. And then we do a fair amount of Salesforce. You know, the uh, oh, Dayback wow. works in FileMaker and in Salesforce, and we've got a big, a pretty big market in uh, uh, in Salesforce for the Dayback calendar. So we do a lot. That's a huge monster to tackle. So I've I've learned it from the inside. I've only learned what I needed to learn to to get through it, but uh, pick up a little bit more knowledge every day. It's it's certainly not FileMaker, but you got you, you, the scalability is certainly impressive. You know, running all that's running what doing what they do on SAS, you know, can't really argue with what they've accomplished. But as far as, you know, huh. there's all sorts of crazy, you know, you can't like, you know, calc fields can only be like 600 characters long, you know, either, you know, relationships are all one way. There's all this stuff that when you get in there and you've been coming from FileMaker, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I can't do this. So it's a, that takes a little adjustments, you know, a little bit of an adjustment. I'm sorry. Once more, when are where are the uh, the updated files going to be available? The sample files. I think Steve's good. He put it. He uh, put the link in the. Um, if you scroll up in the chat a little bit to eight twenty nine, you'll see the link there. It'll still be the same link, or the or are you just going to? I think I'm going to for caching purposes. I think I'm going to create a new one. I'll try. I'll update the old one too. But I know that so if you download it, I have a hell of a. T I'm just not smart enough how to. Where will you know, we find that link? If I don't rename it, 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 a lot of times it, the zip file will get cached on Cloudflare or something like that. And you get the old ones. Okay. So just to make it explicit, I'll, there's a date on that zip link. I'll I'll put a new put the updated date on there. Uh, and again, if you, any confusion about that, email me at jasonsecret.com. I put that in chat. Do you haven't heard by tomorrow? Start. You can start by the new. Tomorrow afternoon, you can start bugging me about that. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. In the video as well? Yeah. The video is fine. I mean, I'll just do the whole thing. Just, I think there were two bugs in there that I, I'll go through the demo files, but the video is the same. You know, and, and the, the other peripheral stuff, the sample files are all the same. I just had a couple of scripts in there. You post that on the seed code site as well, or? Yeah, yeah. I'll have to, yeah, the, the new link that I sent. It'll basically be the same with a, it's, it was a zip with a date. It'll be tomorrow's date on it. Okay. Uh, and you know, so you could you could infer it, but Eric will post it. But again, I'll, I'll, I'll post it as well. I'll update the original one too. But like I said, I've had trouble with with that. Eventually, the the caching, you know, I think Cloudflare caches it. Sure. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Well, great. Thanks so much, uh, Vince and Eric, for having me. I really had fun. Thank you so much, Jason. It's been great. Lots to uh, chew on.